Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that we're not having problems here. I live in a rural area, and sometimes the Internet's a bit sketchy, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's going to do, Oh, you know what? No. Uh, I just see you up here. Uh, mm -hmm. Good, good. We are live. We have two people with us. Hi, Dana. Uh, we should get some um, more folks on here, and we should start to see some comments on the side of your screen. Okay. That would be under public, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Welcome, everyone. Well, it's just Johnny. Is here. Yeah. That's okay. It's good to have people testing the chat. Please, mm -hmm. everyone, comment so we can see that you're here. And uh, this is where you'll be putting your questions in as we move through today's hour. Hi, Melissa. We, we're, we were on time and people are not quite ready yet. Yeah. My kitty wants to come join. <laughs> oh, you know, yesterday Billy's um, six-month-old French bulldog made a cameo. So let's see the kitty while we're waiting for folks. Yeah, she, she's a 10-month, 15-pound Maine Coon. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, you live in Colorado, correct? I do. I'm, I'm in Boulder. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Look at this. Look at this gorgeous cat. I know. She's something. He's huge. He's how old? Ten months. They don't. They, they grow till they're three years of age. So That's incredible. Twenty at twenty ish. Yeah. Um. Bear with me. I'm just going to make yeah. one change here. Yeah. Joni says the title is yeah. wrong. Yeah, because it tried to uh, set us up from the other day. Mm -hmm. Oh, technology people, it will be the death of us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you love it and you hate it. It's a love-hate relationship. It allows yeah. us to do this, but at what a cost. Yeah. Okay, let's see if this is better should be good. I see we have 17 people here. So um, let's let's dive in. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, in our second Facebook Live in support of the Healthy Dog Expo. My guest today is Dr. Rob Silver, Chief Vet Officer of Real Mushrooms. Uh, Dr. Silver is a nationally recognized expert on mushrooms and other herbal and nutraceutical methods of treating animals. He's also expert in cannabinoids uh, and uh, veterinary CBD products. So we kind of might even have some crossover here. So welcome, Dr. Silver. Thank you. Thanks for having me today, Mari. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And you will be joining us at the expo uh, with Real Mushrooms. So mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. Uh, people will have a chance to follow up on what we discuss here, talk with you in person, and learn about all the things that your company has been put putting together. Uh, We're just getting started, so we'll, but we will have about five different products available at the expo. Oh, that's fantastic. And you've been with Real Mushrooms a relatively short amount of time to be making such progress. Um, it started last April, yeah. Okay, in the, in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, it, it takes time to develop a product line. And it sure does. It's, it's been really challenging. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, let's dive in. You're okay. going to give us a bit of an intro to mushrooms. Right? I, I am. Um, I, I like to call mushrooms the Swiss Army knife of supplements. Of course, I also use that term for cannabis and CBD. Mm -hmm. But the reason is because it, they contain so many different bioactive molecules that they, they really touch so many different systems within the body. 
And, you know, if I were to be, you know, stranded on a desert island, you know, what, you know, what plants or, you know, what organisms would I want to have with me to support me? I would definitely want to have some good medicinal, maybe er, you know, edible plus medicinal mushrooms because they can be the same thing. And I probably want to have a couple of hemp plants as well, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's so many different mushrooms and they have certain types of bioactive compounds in common, something called a beta-glucan. But they also have very individual compounds, which makes each mushroom have very um, gener general, but also very specific properties. And it can get confusing to the person who's trying to navigate the different mushrooms to figure out, well, what's the best one for my critter? And it may be that there isn't, you know, there may be there is one single one that's the best, but there may be that it's that you are better off looking at more of a shotgun approach. And this is why the consumer may find in the marketplace mushrooms, uh, mushroom products that have multiple mushrooms in them to, to provide the benefits of several different mushrooms all at the same time. And for certainly for health benefits, for wellness, for, you know, general prevention, you know, a, a shotgun type of formula like that is ideal. But, you know, if you're looking at more specific problems, then you might want to dive down and look at using an individual mushroom um, or several individual mushrooms at the same time to address those things with your, with your critter. And so you asked me to give you the five top reasons to use mushrooms. Yeah. I have to tell you that was hard because it was, you know, how can I, how can I drive, you know, how can I, you know, you know, funnel it down. Found knowledge into and, five things. Yeah, and so on this PDF that, you know, your viewers, uh, that the audience will have, um, in reality, I actually put six, <laughs> six reasons, but, you know, and maybe seven if you want to filter out a couple of them. But what I wanted to do today in our conversation, you know, and I don't want this to be too teachy, too didactic. I'd I'm looking forward to questions and answering them and, and, and having more conversation with you, Dr. Coger. But, um, yeah. you know, in my presentation, I'm going to go through the what I think are the five top reasons and what are some mushrooms that represent those reasons and give you some studies that support that. Now, Unfortunately, we don't have much in the way of studies specifically on our pets, you know. Um, right. We have one or two in dogs. Um, I'm not sure I've seen any in cats or horses. Now, this is something that I'm really excited about working with real mushrooms because they're going to help me f help fund some studies that I'm going to conduct in dogs and eventually in cats showing the safety of mushrooms and then the effectiveness of certain mushrooms. We'll probably start with turkey tail, which has everybody's attention because of its, mm -hmm. it, its published benefits. So, um, you know, that's maybe a long introduction to say probably that the, the best reason about edible mushrooms is that they're edible, you know, and, you know, and there's, there's different types. We have edible mushrooms, we've got medicinal mushrooms, and there could be an overlap. Many of our really prized edible mushrooms like shiitake, for instance, or maitake or um, oyster mushroom have, you know, really potent, you know, um, benefits, you know, to mm -hmm. humans and to pets. Um, but then we also have the strictly medicinal mushrooms, which are very woody and probably don't lend themselves well to being sauteed up, you know, in your stir fry sure. or something like that, but, but have, you know, huge medicinal benefits. And some of their benefits actually come from them growing on the tree and driving from the tree certain natural elements that the tree has as well. So that's a really interesting concept. So mushrooms, depending on the tree it's growing on, might actually have, you know, the same mushroom growing on a different tree might have different levels of potency. Um, and then, um, we have the toxic mushrooms and, and, you know, when I talk to vets about mushrooms, the first thing they say is, oh yeah, they're poisonous. And, and that's because, you know, so many vets have to deal with these mushroom poisonings when the dog is in the backyard and, and mushrooms have come up after a rain and they're eating these mushrooms and they turn out to be highly toxic. So that's mm -hmm. our first impression. Just when you say cannabis to a vet, the first thing they think is, oh, you know, THC going to the ER, right. terrible. Um, and then we have the psychedelic psychedelic mushrooms, the psilocybin, and there's a lot of interest in that. I'm not going to touch on that today. Um, and we don't, you know, the company Real Mushrooms doesn't really deal with that directly. Um, but there's a great deal of interest. And there may be some applications for those for PTSD and for, you know, and for these fear behaviors in dogs. But I'm not quite sure how we're going, you know, I'm not the person who wants to give that to the first dog to see how they're going to react. Right. 
how do you, you know, how do you figure out a dosage, you know, in that regard. But, you know, in, in my PDF, and, and I'll, I'll read from it a bit just so I can be more precise, um, there's many benefits that mushrooms can, can, can create. And certainly we, we, if we have psychedelic mushrooms, they, there's obviously molecules that are being created in a mushroom that can have an effect on the brain. Well, there's other mushrooms which aren't psychedelic, but also have molecules in them which also have an effect on the brain and nervous system, which can create, which can reduce anxiety, can actually promote healing if there's trauma to the nervous system, and other benefits as well. And we'll go, what I'm going to do is with each of these different applications, we'll then go and look at the mushrooms that apply to those. So stress, stress, anxiety, behavior, that's one big category. We'll talk about that. And then looking at inflammation and, and really in many regards, looking at infections as well, both acute and chronic, in terms of the impact that the beta-glucans in these mushrooms have and some of the other molecules have on benefiting the immune system. And I noticed there's a, well, a bunch of questions there. And Already, I, yeah. I know one that I saw that I just glanced at as we were getting ready to go was, you know, can you overstimulate the immune system? And the way that these molecules, the beta-glucan molecules and other molecules work in the mushroom is not to overstimulate, but it's to really harmonize. Is there a way, it's a way of, of allowing the immune system to work better. If the immune system's overstimulated, like in allergies or autoimmune disease, it can bring that down. If the, if the immune system is deficient for some reason, maybe it's a stressed out puppy that won't take its rabies vaccination or will, will be vaccinated for rabies but won't achieve any kind of protection mm -hmm. from that, mushrooms can bring up the immune system and provide protection. So they're really balancers. They're harmonizers. They're, it's, it's really neat. It, and mushrooms are... Are representative of you know all of the natural world. Many plants. I'm an herbalist as well. Many plants have those same that same function. They don't you know they don't stimulate the immune system. They harmonize it. They balance it. So anyway, that's about inflammation and infection. So we'll go over that in, in just a little bit. Um, and actually, in that same category of immune enhancement is the is the fourth bullet point, which is vaccination titers. And there actually is a really cool study I'll yeah. share with you. Um, in Eastern Europe with shelter puppies that were not able to achieve protection from the rabies vaccinations and the mushrooms helped with that. Then, you know, looking at other aspects of immune system is cancer, you know, and cancer is a big problem in humans and in pets for many, many reasons. We have a toxic environment, food supply and food chain is, you know, is, is highly processed and you know, and, and uh, industrial agriculture is depleting our soils. I mean, there's, I could go on forever about all the potential global causes for this uprise in cancer in ourselves and our pets. And mushrooms have a good, are a good solution to that because historically they have been found to be beneficial to patients who have cancer for a number of reasons. And there's quite a few studies in that regards in other species. And we have one pretty good study. It's not as good as I'd like to see it be in dogs with turkey tail. We'll talk about that in just a bit as well when we go on when we talk about turkey tail. But um, we're not just talking about knocking down the cancer. We're also talking about all the side effects from cancer and from chemotherapy. So for instance, with chemotherapy, oftentimes we'll see problems with um, anemia and low white counts because the chemotherapeutic agents affect the bone marrow. And um, mushrooms have been shown to stimulate, yes, stimulate the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells and more white blood cells. So, and it can, they can help with nausea and they can also help just with this, you know, this thing that we call quality of life. And that quality of life is really, I think, what we're really all trying to achieve. You know, even though we talk about specific medical benefits, ultimately it's the quality of life of our pets, of our patients that we're, that we're trying to create. And mushrooms, I think, can be a very key player in that. Um, stamina and endurance. So many dogs these days are involved in agility. We've got search and rescue dogs. There are so many athletes out there that run with their dogs, you know, perform with their dogs. And there are mushrooms that can actually enhance stamina and endurance through their ability to increase the production of energy from existing sources of energy. But they also function as adaptogens. Mushrooms, most 
every mushroom is an adaptogen. And this may be a term that's not your, that people aren't familiar with. Um, there's a number of different adaptogens. Licorice root's an adaptogen. Yeah. And bagulus and, and ginseng, mushrooms are as well. And what an adaptogen does is it adapts the body to stress. And it works primarily on the adrenal glands. So, you know, athletes, you know, are under a certain type of stress, competitive stress. So we have, there's a mushroom for that. You know? <laughs> I guess that's kind of the, the funny way of looking at it. And we also know that um, mushrooms can be helpful with skin problems, with allergies, okay, mm -hmm. which is big in our pets as well. Um, and right now, we're looking at using mushrooms as a very safe and natural source of vitamin D for our pets. Wow. You, uh, Dr. Cobra and I were having a conversation just before this about the vitamin D testing and how many animals we see that have low vitamin D. And we know that low vitamin D is associated with many chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, cancer, even even more, even hospitalization mortality is affected by vitamin D levels. And to have a nice source of vitamin D that's natural, that's organic, yeah that has other beneficial molecules in it. So, so that's something else that, that I won't really go into that in great depth at all today. But that's kind of the preview of what I'd like to discuss. Yeah. My goodness, we have so many. We do, we do. So and how, I, do want, how do you want to do this? I mean, do you want me to just- so Let me mention one thing about the PDF first, which okay. if you go to the Expo website, there's a tab that says downloads and you will find the PDF that Dr. Silver has referenced as a download there. Yeah. For you. So, you know, these links and the studies we're talking about, you can actually click and read the originals. Um, so why don't we, um, I'm, I'm just scrolling back through some questions. Sure. And uh, I, I, actually, I almost prefer doing questions. I really don't yeah. want this to be teachy. I, I'd like yeah. to really- It's more of a conversation. So yeah. Address the needs of your audience as well, you know, for information. Yeah. So we talked about the balancing of the immune system. Yes. Um, so, uh, let me just pull this right on screen. Karen asks for dogs with cancer, would you recommend increasing the normal dosage of medicinal mushrooms? Absolutely. So maybe there's, yeah. So can you speak a bit to how we dose mushrooms in general and what factors we might consider? I can. And, you know, it's, the, there's a, you know, there's a lot of variation from one mushroom cultivation to another mushroom cultivation in terms of the actives in it. If you're, if you're harvesting mushrooms from the wild, there can also be differences in what the content mm -hmm. is. One of the benefits of going with a real mushrooms product, and I'm not trying to market the stuff here, is that it's all been standardized. And it's cultivated under USDA certified organic conditions. So there's a lot of uniformity. So you know that from one product to the next, mm -hmm. you can be certain that you're getting a very specific amount of beta glucans. And because beta glucans are the common compound amongst all mushrooms, my, my way of dosing is to use the beta glucan content because there's established dosages for beta glucan in animals. Use the beta glucan content as a way to establish a starting dosage for that particular mushroom or mushrooms and then give them to the animal at that level and observe over a period of a week or two to usually two to three weeks is what we'll see with some sort of response. See how the animal does with that. And then because of the high level of safety of um, turn my stupid texts off. So oh, high, high level, alone. <laughs> high, well, it's my family. High level of safety uh, with mushrooms. You can double the dosage. You can triple the dosage. I read a study where with turkey tail, they found that dosages a hundred times higher than standard dosages were still safe. So we're really yeah. So we're really trying to get to a dosage that's going to be efficacious. And I think cancer is big stuff, you know. And I think yeah. you have to use big doses for it, but I don't recommend starting with a big dose. As you've probably seen yourself, Dr. Cobra, there's some animals mm -hmm. that, you know, even you just give them a little pinch of something and they yeah. have a reaction. And it's once, you know, an animal has a reaction to something, it's really hard to convince the pet parent to get back up on that horse and get exactly. back in, you know? So, um, so that's why I always recommend starting low and, you know, and yeah. making sure your animal's adapting to that okay, and then gradually increasing it after that. Yeah, and measuring your, your response so that you know when you can just well, 
as best you can. I mean, you know, obviously there's some yeah. conditions it's really difficult to get a response. You might have to do an ultrasound to see what the size of that tumor is in the tummy. And, and we've been doing that with, I've got some, some uh, clients that are doing that and we are seeing some benefits. I would like to be, I'd like to give a disclaimer, you know, say we're not making medical claims here about our mushroom products. The FDA doesn't like that, but also that results vary. If, you know, there's many, many types of cancer and there's many types of immune systems that are being, you know, that are trying to address that cancer and, and different types of mushrooms. So it's, it's not an exact science at this point in time, but we're trying to get things into a ballpark. Effectively. Yeah. Um, Let's, uh, let me see. Yeah, like Can we talk briefly about mushrooms during pregnancy. This is, this is one of my people, Libby, who happens to have a Bernese mountain dog that we oh. hope is pregnant. Yes. Um, have you used mushrooms during pregnancy and lactation at all? I don't have much data for that. And I'm always very cautious about recommending anything um, with pregnant um, with, with, you know, with um, mm -hmm. conception, yeah. with pregnancy, with parturition, lactation, the whole thing, simply because we don't know enough. And it's a really difficult study to do, you know, without creating some problems. So um, I guess the question I would ask Libby back would be, why do you want to use them? You know, it's a, it's a relatively yeah. short period of time, you know, for the mother, um, you know, two to four months, maybe, which Perhaps they'd be fine without it, but we just don't have the data. And and it's probably safe, but I can't say that it is. I, I would not want to give any information that would be harmful. I'm sorry. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Dolly has an interesting question. Okay. The best form to put mushrooms in. Okay. And something that I've been confused with because I see dry products, I see capsules, I see tinctures. Good question. Okay. Well, first of all, most of the goodies in the mushroom are hidden behind these, these, these cell walls that are very, very strong. And in order to get the goodies out so that we can, it can go into our bodies or our pet's bodies, the best way to do that is to boil the mushroom or boil the, the dried mushroom powder in water, in hot water, for a sufficient period of time, 30 minutes to, to two hours, depending on how woody it is and everything else. That helps to break down that cell wall and release these goodies. And so, um, a liquid, not a tincture, but a liquid that would be what we call a decoction in herbal medicine, which would be the, the boiled, you know, the, the, um, the soup that's made from, you know, boiling the mushrooms and putting mushrooms into soup is a great way, you know, to get, you know, get dried mushrooms and put them into a soup with vegetables and meat. And if you're home feeding your pet, that's a great way to help improve health, you know, of course. Um, but the, you know, the mushroom powders that Real Mushrooms makes are already hot water extracted and they're analyzed so we know what the content is. Now, my challenge in, de in designing this, um, this pet, this product, this, this line of pet products of mushrooms, because to me, the most important thing about a pet product is that it's palatable, that you can get it into the pet. If you can't get it to the pet, who cares how powerful it is or what mm -hmm. it does, you know? And, and, and there's so many different types of, of um, palatability issues that pets can have. And we won't even talk about cats yet you know, as far as that. So, um, so I think that the best form is the form that first of all, you know, has the highest potency in terms of, you know, being extracted through the hot water extraction, and then the format that will get into the critter. You know, if it's a liquid, probably an alcohol tincture is not the best idea, but you can use a glycerin, a vegetable glycerin, base to make it sweeter and put it into a liquid tincture. There is a company that makes a maitake defraction, um, which mm -hmm. maitake is a very powerful mushroom for cancer. And they've made this defraction for pets into a glyceride. We're looking at that as one possible uh, um, administration uh, trick to use. We've currently got two soft chew products that we'll have available for us at the Pet Expo. Um, one that's for relaxing and one that's for immune enhancement. We'll have those in hand. In fact, we're about we're putting them in inventory as we speak. So the soft chews certainly are one way to do that, um, as well as a powder. Many of these powders are very palatable. They're they're not they're not that distasteful at all. And if you put them in the food and you put them and you make the food attractive, I wouldn't sprinkle right. them 
kibble, and I'm not really a big proponent of kibble anyway, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it you know needs to be blended in with the food. Um, I think that that's as good a way as any to administer it. Get it into the animal. It's the single most important. Yeah. Theory. That is that is huge and well said. Thank uh, you. So uh, shifting back, you you spoke about inflammation. Yes. And Ashley has a question about her German Shepherd with severe elbow arthritis. Yes. So I have him on galloprant, but it's not enough. Is there a blend of medicinal mushrooms that could help with pain and inflammation? Would it be a blend or would it be a single species? Um, well, I, you know, looking, looking at, you know, some of the other molecules that are in the mushrooms that have anti-inflammatory effect, you know, I think that we could certainly say that mushrooms could help with inflammation. And I think that they could help with pain, but I wouldn't look to them as being, you know, as being totally reliable in, in, in being able to reduce the discomfort of your shepherd that's on a pharmaceutical that's, you know, much much stronger than that. And although the topic here is mushrooms, you know, I would say looking at a combination of, and, and reishi would probably be the first mushroom that I would recommend, the Ganoderma mushroom. It's very bitter. So getting, taking it in capsule form or our five defenders, which is a blend of five mushrooms, including reishi, you know, that has good beta glucan content would be, you know, probably good sources, you know, in terms of helping to re helping, you know, cause it's a, it's really, you know, it's really a bunch of different things we put together at the same time that all work together synergistically to reduce inflammation. So certainly the galloprant's part of that, a low, low, you know, a diet that doesn't promote inflammation. Um, fish oil itself can be, you know, excellent long-term at higher doses for inflammation. Um, but I think also looking at CBD, you know, or, you know, yeah. a, a broad spectrum CBD on top of everything else. And it's no surprise that, um, that, we're, that we see some C CBD products that actually have mushrooms in them. And I'd just like to comment on the side, if I could, that it's fascinating to me that, you know, 10 years ago, there was this incredible interest in by the pet parents in the use of CBD to help their animals where we know conventional medicine wasn't hasn't been able to. And, you know, now everyone's really kind of into it. And we're, you know, there's some regulatory issues, but, you know, CBD has kind of become, a, you know, a part of our therapeutic, you know, regimen and now we're looking at mushrooms and there's so much similarity between those two and i'm sure there is plenty of synergy as well if they're combined i'm sorry for your shepherd's elbow arthritis i found that that painful joints in the front part of the body especially like with acupuncture and laser are much more difficult to remediate than in the rear part of the body just because 60 percent of the dog's weight is on that all the time it's a tough one and i, I wish you will it, yeah, it is. It is, especially with a shepherd. Yes. Um, so Angie asks mm -hmm. her dog has, and I thought with thinking about this question and of course the UPenn study with turkey tail, let's talk mushrooms and cancer for a moment. Absolutely. Okay. So um, Angie, it looks like you're doing, you know, a nice combination formula and Cancer is such a tough thing, and anal sac cancer in itself is also a, pro a big problem. Um, so doing it using as many things as you can can be helpful. Artemisinin, I think, can be helpful for certain types of, of you know, aggressively growing tumors. There's a certain protocol that, you know, that I think is, that, that should be followed to improve the benefit of artemisinin. But let's talk about mushrooms. Yes, you can add mushrooms very safely to the combination that you're doing. And there was a study at the University of Pennsylvania, I believe it was published in 2012, and um, they were measuring the, well, actually the, the, the original study was, was being funded by a Chinese company that had made this extract, the special extract of the turkey tail mushroom, and they wanted to get FDA approval of it. And in order to get FDA approval, oftentimes we'll see these companies start with veterinarians and with veterinary species because it's a lot easier, less expensive for them to get some positive results, which the FDA then likes to see prior to doing, you know, the human trials. And they were doing the very first part of this study, which was just to find out which dosage was most effective in these dogs. And although everyone quotes this study, and I think it's worth looking at, 
you need to know that there were only five dogs in each group. So it wasn't a very large group. But they took dogs that had a type of cancer called hemangiosarcoma, which is a very aggressive, usually terminal, briefly, you know, very quickly terminal disease, a tumor on the spleen, which will grow and rupture and they bleed out into their belly and they get very weak. And then, you know, of course, the bleeding of the spleen and the belly seeds all the other organs with, meta with metastatic tumors. Very nasty. And so the first thing that we do when we diagnose that with a dog is to remove that spleen. And hopefully we get it before it ruptures, which improves our long-term you know, prognosis. But we get that spleen out, and then typically oncologists recommend um, chemotherapy, which is not all that successful. Historically, we see survival times maybe 80 days, maybe 100 days top. So in this study, they did three different tiers of dosing, and they and they and they were really surprised with the results because they found that the highest tier of dosing, which was 100 mg per keg, which you know would be about 50 milligrams per pound per day, um, actually allowed these dogs that had hemangiosarcoma to live twice as long, just about as the dogs that had their spleens removed and received chemotherapy. So that made everybody say, wow, this is really something good. Mm -hmm. It is. We need bigger studies. And apparently they were trying to do a study where they would include chemotherapy with the mushroom because there's a lot of evidence um, from studies in Asia where humans are using mushrooms hand in hand with chemotherapy that That's mushrooms right. can actually benefit the outcomes with chemotherapy or radiation. So they actually support that whole process. So, so turkey tail is what we think of there are other mushrooms that also are very good for cancer, and it was mentioned in a prior um, question that um, Rishi and Chaga, and I would like to add my Taki to that, are probably the, the ones that are best known for their um, you know, ability to address cancer, but the other ones are as well. I've seen studies for lion's mane that we'll talk about with cognitive function that also helped with cancer. I mean, that's, that's why I call these guys the Swiss Army knife, because they have so many so many benefits, you know. So many applications, yeah. But Angie, yes, you can definitely add the mushrooms. And, you know, as I suggested, start, you know, slowly and, you know, work your way up, starting with, you know, the beta-glucan dosing. And what we're going to have with these pet products will make it easy because we're going to have dosing recommendations on the label by weight. And that should, you know, simplify things. As far as a starting dosage, we can then escalate from there based on need. Sounds great. Now, along, along that line of, of dosing and such, Christina asks, do we have to worry about anything interfering with the absorption? That's a good question. I have not read anything that suggests that. Now, beta, and actually, beta-glucans aren't really absorbed. Um, they're, they're, they're really, they're, they're, um, they're um, molecules that target a receptor. And in fact, there's four or five receptors. And these receptors are on the cells that line the bowel. And so, you know, you ingest it, it goes down into your, into your gut, the body breaks it down so you have more of the, the molecules directly available, and it stimulates these receptors. And that's kind of, the, you know, just like I talk about CBD, that's the key in the lock that turns on the engine of the immune system, you know, and gets it going. And so it may not even be necessary to absorb them. I haven't read anything about the pharmacokinetics in terms of the actual blood levels of it, you know, they, and so... And they oftentimes they can recover full beta glucans in the stool, and yet they still have um, immune benefit. So I don't I don't have a direct answer to you, Christine. I have not read anything that says there's anything contraindicated with the use of mushrooms. Okay. Um, so shifting to a little different disease process. Mm -hmm. um, what about for dogs with IBD or GI distress of any type? Um, well, I think that um, for IBD, um, the, you know, and, you know, I have to say, you know, these are good questions. Um, we are just in the infancy of learning all the details of this. And so I don't have a specific mushroom, use this mushroom for that. But because of the benefit to harmonizing the immune system and reducing, you know, the excesses, um, and also the other benefit the mushrooms have, which is not these, these, these bioactive molecules like um, beta-glucans or terpenes, but the fiber 
in mushrooms is a prebiotic. And there's good studies that show that mushrooms also support a healthy microbiome. And there's a lot of studies that showing IBD is an, is, you know, is an imbalance in the microbiome due to excessive you know, um, exposure to antigens that the body's not used to getting. And so um, I would say, you know, I would go with a shotgun type approach in terms of, you know, looking at Rishi is probably, Rishi is considered to be the mushroom of immortality or longevity. Um, it's the mushroom of the emperors. It has so many different properties um, that I would say Rishi would be a primary mushroom that I would recommend. Ganoderma lingzhi, very, very bitter. So um, we're coming out with it in capsules, and that will be good. Powder, the only way I can take the powder is in my espresso, because the espresso is pretty bitter, and it masks the bitterness. <laughs> yeah, we have reishi. We've got five defenders in our soft shoes coming out, and that has the reishi in it as well. I would probably go with the shotgun, like our five defenders, which has reishi and, and um, maitake and shiitake and and I'm probably not going to get them all. Uh, chaga, and I know there's one more. I'm sorry, don't remember that one. But um, yeah, but, but a combination approach. Yeah, I, that's what I would do for that with IBD. CBD can also be helpful, by the way. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so Debbie wants to know. So it was, we're sort of going through the different body systems. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Uh, what about dogs with kidney disease? Well, I, you know, kidney disease is a big category. There could be a lot of, a lot of, you know, you know, there's a lot of different types of kidney disease. So to give you a generic answer, like for all kidney disease, don't know, you know, it could be an immune mediated kidney disease, like with what we call the glomerular nephritis, you know, um, there's a lot of different possibilities. We don't have one that has specifically been proven in studies to be supportive with kidney disease, but again, you know, I would suggest um, looking at something that would be a combination formula, looking at reishi and turkey tail, you know, we think about it for cancer, but turkey tail has a wide variety of other applications. Turkey tail has been recognized as having the highest level of beta-glucan of all the mushrooms and is very rich in a number of, of these other molecules. We call them terpenes. We call them triterpenes. They're, um, they're similar, to, in fact, many of them to the same molecules we find in CBD. And there even is some evidence that there's CBD-like molecules in some mushrooms, for instance, uh, truffles are known to have um, anandamide, which is our body's own CBD. Fascinating. It is, yeah. There's so it much. Is. And, you know, I deal a lot with Lyme-associated kidney uh -huh. disease and dogs up here. Mm -hmm. And to me, I would think of anything that supported the immune system might be helpful Absolutely. in that scenario. Absolutely. But these are all things that, these are great questions, and these are all things that, you know, I will be, um, over time, we'll be answering in documents and white papers, and and uh, they, the I love love that your company is doing science as well as just you know making good products. I would not be part of them if they were not you know very education and science forward. This is yeah. who I am, and for me, it's a great opportunity to add to the literature to help the critters and also to help veterinarians because. You know, we need to get veterinarians involved in these alternative therapies, and the way to do that is to show them the science, you know? Definitely. We've had a couple questions on seniors and relating to seniors. Uh -huh. um, Donna asked specifically about lion's mane. Uh -huh. can, you, can you speak to what about our older dogs? Well, lion's mane is a remarkable mushroom, and um, if you've ever taken a look at what the mushroom actually looks like, it looks kind of like a brain, you know, it's white and it's, it's, I, I had some earlier this week. I was going to show you in my, the Tuesday that didn't work, but we, right. had, we had it for dinner last night. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful mushroom to eat as well. It's a delightful edible mushroom, but mm -hmm. um, Alliance Main contains these molecules in it, which um, actually promote something called a um, nerve growth factor. And so in cases of injury, damage, trauma to the nervous system, lion's mane can help with that repair process. But we've also found that lion's mane can also aid in cognition. And as our critters get older, you know, they start to get a little bit, you know, a little bit um, not there, not present. Yeah. And lion's mane, along with some other nutrient nutrients like it, can really help quite a bit 
with that geriatric cognition difficulty. And personally, I think that lion's mane should be paired with reishi. I'm a very, I'm very fond of reishi as a mushroom because it has so many benefits and so many wide ranging benefits. So um, I would say lion's mane is something that should become part of a geriatric dog's um, daily regimen. Can be administered. It's a very palatable powder. And we'll be coming out with the powder soon. And um, for those picky, picky critters, you know, we'll have it in capsules. And we've got lion's mane and reishi together in this one soft chew that I've created, along with some other herbs such as um, ashwagandha. You know, so and we also have some uh, tryptophan in that as well. So it, oh, nice. Yeah, so it should be a pretty nice formula once we have it in hand and can use it. Yeah, definitely. I, I hope that helps, Donna. Yeah. Uh, Anne has an interesting question. I like those. Okay. Ah, okay. Well, oh, boy, yeah. this, is, this is the old, you know, um, um, fruiting body, which is what the actual, you know, mushroom is that we associate with. Here, here, here my favorite mushroom. This is my, my mushroom. Isn't that beautiful? This, really? is the, this is the entire fruiting body here, we call the mushroom. But the mycelium is down here, and it's sort of the roots, but it's not really the roots. Um, so the mycelium can be very powerful, you know, um, in, and it's a part of all fungal cultures. We get penicillin and antibiotics and, mm -hmm. and, um, and a variety of other um, um, very bioactive molecules pharmaceutically extracted from the mycelium of simple fungi. But in mushrooms, they have the mycelium precedes the, um, the growth of these fruiting bodies that then produce the spores, which then seed more mycelium. And so the mycelium can create very powerful substances. But most, and, and for instance, the turkey tail extract that had such good results in that study came from the mycelium of the turkey tail. But here's the difference. The mycelium from the turkey tail was grown in a special nutrient broth that concentrated and provided nutrients to kind of amplify the new you know what was in in that growing mycelium and then they take that and they extract it so you just have a single molecule extracted it's very pharmaceutical in nature nothing wrong with that obviously we see in that study it has benefit but many of the products that we see in the marketplace which are competitors to real mushrooms they grow the mushroom the, the mycelium on grain which is typically part of the mushroom cultivation process. But once we get the mycelium growing on the grain, typically we'll take that and put that on the natural substrate for that mushroom. Like if it's turkey tail, we'll put it into a log, a dead log, and it'll grow on the dead log. Um, but many companies skip that step. They take the mycelium that's growing on the grain and they dry that. So what you have is you've got mycelium on grain, we call it mog, and it's 50% carbohydrates from grain. And I know I'm talking to a lot of pet parents who specifically look for grain-free diets. And people that have their pets on cancer try to reduce the carbohydrate intake because carbohydrates feed cancer. So although I'm sure there is some potency to the mycelium on grain, my recommendation is go for the fruiting body, I think. And historically, thousands of years treating people with mushrooms, it's not treating them with the mycelium, they're treating them with the fruiting body. So that's my recommendation as far as that. You may find that the MOG products are a little cheaper, you know, but don't be attracted by that. It's a matter of value. You know, what are the pennies per milligram of beta-glucan? Studies that compare the beta-glucan content in mycelium to the beta-glucan content in fruiting bodies, there's a difference of five to 10 times greater beta glucans in the fruiting body than in the mycelium. That's that's astounding. And I wasn't aware that they were growing them on grains. That makes no sense. Well I, I'm I'm growing some um, edible mushrooms myself here in my own house. And I start with the grain. I'm kind of learning the pro you know, every time I uh, to try to become an expert on some topic, I immerse myself and I grow hemp in my backyard. You know, I, you know, I do those sorts of things. So I'm growing that here to learn more about it. And, and then will you transplant it to another medium? Yes, absolutely. Oh, you know, we'll, 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 or... well, we, well, wood chips, sterilized wood, wood chips with straw. Oh. Yeah, and some compost, and you put it in that, and then phew, you get you get these wonderful edible mushrooms to eat. We need to see photos. 
Okay. Your, your very own little garden out there. Yes. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. We probably can't really give out dosages. Um, Peter had an interesting question. Uh, he asked about some, a mushroom I've never heard of, chicken of the woods. Well, chicken of the woods is the same thing as maitake, Peter. Oh, okay. okay. And, and we already have maitake in the five defenders, and we're looking very closely at um, what we can do with that in addition, because it is such a potent mushroom for cancer, among some other things. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's in the development stage right now. If you, if you really are fond of maitake, you know, you can find it in the five defenders. We've talked about just coming out with another powdered formula of just maitake itself, but um, we're just looking at different options. But that's a very good question, Peter. And it's, it's a, uh, and, and, you know, these mushrooms grow wild, you know, in the, especially in the Northeast area where you are, you know, and the, and the Northwest. And you can find um, chicken of the woods. You can find the maitake just, you know, growing on a stump somewhere. And, uh, the, and in fact, there's a story about that, if I can digress just a little sure. bit. For those, for, for in those cultures where they actually um, wildcraft, where they, they, they harvest the wild mushrooms, the families will pass down from one generation to the other the secret locations of where they find the maitake mushroom because it's such a prized edible mushroom that it's it's got that kind of value within families so i think that's just a really cool little anecdote about that so. that, that is mm -hmm. and just to show you it's not just me dana would like to know more about the process of you growing your own mushrooms i think there's there's a blog or your very own little webinar or something there. Definitely. And, and forage, mushroom foraging as well. These are very popular yeah. these days. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, and there's, there's now, it says a number of different companies that are providing, you know, sterilized culture medium, all the things that you need. A lot of it's directed towards people that are growing psilocybin because there's a large subculture of people that are doing it that way in order to access it for their own needs primarily not recreational primarily you know for depression and, and ptsd sure. um and you know i don't know how we could communicate directly but certainly be happy to share some of those links for some of those um cultivation um companies online that also have large amounts of of information about how to do it yeah. so it's, it's it's becoming very popular these days yeah i think with covid everybody kind of said oh i you know maybe i should plant a garden yeah. and it, like inspired these at home yeah. things, whether they were gardens or home improvements, that sort of thing. We did that. <laughs> yeah, we all did. We were trapped at home, what we're gonna do. But yeah. an herb, I did an herb garden. Yeah. And you know, I forgot how much I enjoyed gardening. So yeah. Yeah. it's right. It's 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 grounding, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. And and it tastes better and I can I grew herbs I can share with my dog. Oh, sorry. Oh, what's happening? I turned my phone off. I promise I did. You well, turned it off not. <laughs> not, not. I didn't turn the computer off. Okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, we kind of, it's hard to give specific doses. I can help though. But we can get to talk about some general concepts. Right? Yeah, yeah, I can help. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, um, what we're doing, well, well, we'll have those dosages on the labels of the products, and we're waiting for those products to come into inventory. It's been a struggle to get them manufactured and everything else. We've got five that we'll have available at the Pet Expo, and then we'll have five, at least five more coming down after that as soon as we can. Um, so we'll have that information on it. But I base that information on um, established dosages for beta-glucans. And the dosages for beta-glucans, interestingly enough, are the same no matter what species you're using. So um, so the lower dosage, which, and we do this, I, I'll express this in mg per kg, just because that's my medical background, but a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So basically, if you divide that number in half, you can figure out how many milligrams per pound. And, you know, and the, the real mushrooms products also tell you what the beta-glucan content is that you're getting in that container. So, you know, for, for what I call with wellness and general, you know, just general low grade types of issues, we look at about two and a half to five migs per kg per day of beta glucans. When you start looking at more serious problems, then you're looking at more of the, the, um, the, the, the 
10 to 20. It's a, it's a loose, you know, it's not precise like you're dosing, you know, ibuprofen or something, but it's loose. So that would be for more serious problems. And then in studies that I've seen where beta-glucans have been successful in reducing the growth of cancer, we're seeing dosages higher than 20 mg per kg, like 20 to 30 mg per kg per day of the beta-glucans. So that's kind of a ballpark. If you've got a product that already tells you what the beta-glucan content is, and all of the, you know, the, the Real Mushrooms has been in existence for seven years. It's very popular. A lot of people are buying the human products, um, and the human products have that beta-glucan content on the, on the, the package. So you can then take this information and apply it to human products. I'd like you to wait till the pet products come out, but I understand there's some needs, there's some more immediate needs, because that's going to be, what, about a month from now, isn't it? Um, yeah, March 19th and 20th. Almost, you yeah, know, almost exactly a month, a month and a yeah. week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to be, you're going to be very busy in that time frame. Looking forward to it. We're going to have some chocolate with mushrooms in it, too. Oh, really? We've got some cool stuff, yeah. That sounds, that sounds amazing. Yeah. That not, for, amazing. not for the pets, of course, because we know chocolate's toxic. Right, right. You know, if, but, yeah. if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So we want to keep the we want to keep the pet parent. Yeah. Um, you know, on the human side, I see mushrooms being mixed into coffee frequently. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, does that have any effect with caffeine and how you know, or is it just a convenient way to get them? It is a convenient way to get them, and um, and particularly, and as I mentioned, my taking reishi in my espresso. Um, right. It, uh, the coffee does defeat some of the bitterness of, of, of a few of the mushrooms that we have. And really, it's reishi and chaga are probably the two most challenging mm -hmm. um, in terms of the bitterness. Turkey tail, mm, it's pretty, it's, it's really relatively palatable. It's kind of a sweet, sour taste. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think there's any impact on the coffee other than it being a good delivery vehicle for it. Um, and we've got, like, we've got chocolates that have mushrooms in them. We've also got hot chocolate. That has a reishi, oh. yeah. So for our for our human um, customers and, and for our pet parents, you know. So we'll we'll have some samples of those available. That'll be fun. You know? That'll be a lot of fun. It is fun. Yeah. A lot of a lot of the comments are very much in support of the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, I, who could you know? That's a no brainer. <laughs> it's a no. It's a no brainer. Yeah. So yeah. So you'll be you'll be here. Mm -hmm. um, I will at the expo and uh, in the courtyard with the other exhibitors and sponsors. So I can't wait. Yep, it's gonna be our first opportunity to- First trade show, right? In Since public, the in public, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So you guys have heard it here first. You have. Yeah. Any last minute questions as we wrap up and let Dr. Silver get back to the rest of his day? Just. I'm having so much fun. I hope this never ends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's, here's one from another Angie. Oh, uh, we had somebody here from Ireland and I forget you're, you're reaching around the globe. I know. I saw that. That's amazing. Isn't it amazing? The power of social media. Right. So he has a 13 year old Boston Terrier with an MCT. Right. Um, and, uh, I can see the rest of this. Clear margins went, were removed uh, from surgery June 17th of last year. Mm -hmm. Turkey tail and five defenders, should she add anything else? Well, I, I understand your your nervousness, you know, about what you're giving being enough. Mastos, yeah. But, but I think that I think the turkey tail and the reishi combined, you know, is a very good blend. I would look more instead of adding another formula. I would look at perhaps escalating the dosage, you know, of what you have, because um, I because the turkey tail's proven, you know, uh, no, that's probably a difficult word, the wrong word to use, but turkey tail has shown itself to be, you know, effective for for many types of cancer, um, in, anecdotally. Yeah, definitely. Um, can you also speak to the agaricus uh, mushrooms? Um, well, let me kind of go back to that question just before. Oh, okay. There's so much, so much information. Um, with mast cells, especially if they're act, with mast cells, mast cell tumors, especially if they're active, they have a, the, the problem is they, one of the things they can do is release histamine. 
which is mast cells are part of our allergic response. And that histamine can cause, you know, itching and redness and, and adverse symptoms. And sometimes even when you're removing it, you get that as a problem. Rishi, which is in five defenders, um, has antihistamine properties. I mean, I would use reishi with uh, with allergy animals as well, because not just because of the immune system benefits, but because it actually has some antihistaminic benefits. So, so that so you're doing right as far as those two formulas. But I wanted to add in specifically with mast cell tumors that I think reishi is definitely something that needs to be considered. It's so bitter, I would use it in the five defenders as you have. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, next question. So um, agaricus. Yes, agaricus I is is a pretty amazing mushroom. Um, we the for whatever the reasons are, perhaps because of the cultivation issues, I'm not quite sure. I mean, we have so many different species of mushrooms, but we really have not focused on the agaricus. And um, you know, there's there's a variety of different species and subspecies within the agaricus genus. And, and all of them have some benefit, you know, in some level. We have the, you know, the agaricus blazii that was found down in South America. And we even got the button mushrooms, which have, you know, um, immune benefits. So agaricus is a, is a great mushroom. And yeah, I used it on my own dog, got in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, he had prostatic cancer that meted to his liver. Exactly. And he lived for years, and we measured his liver mass is never enlarged. Yeah, you know, it was phenomenal. And that was, you know, I knew nothing about mushrooms. Yeah, but the papers. I always feel like it never gets talked about that, that it's a viable option. Uh, well, it's it's. I think what's happened. Agaricus is one of the first. I think Agaricus and Maitake. Um, yeah. the first products that were out there that were in the veterinary world. The agaricus was promoted by Alice Villa Lobos. He was one of the first female sure. veterinary oncologist, and um, and she promoted it to me, and I put it in my first oncology product for Arx Vitamins, and it was very successful, mm -hmm. and it still is. But um, you know, I have to work with what this company is manufacturing. Sure. And right. We'll, we'll look at agaricus. It's a it's a big process for them to start an entirely new species. So, yeah. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, but we will um, we'll, we'll touch on agaricus as well because it's a great mushroom. Cool. And we'll go with one last question from Pat. Okay. Since here in the Northeast, tick-borne diseases, and I would extend it beyond Lyme. We have Ehrlichia. We have uh, anaplasmosis. We have more Rocky Mountain spotted fever here on the East Coast than you do in Colorado. Well, that's for sure. It's I don't know why they call it Rocky Mountain. North I don't know Colorado. either. And North Carolina, in particular, seems to be a heart sure. of tick infections. Um, you know, we don't have any specific studies that I have read about mushrooms and Lyme. They would probably be in human patients, but mm -hmm. certainly given their benefit to the immune system, to balance the immune system, we know with Lyme, we get an auto, almost an autoimmune-like kind of reaction with it, that um, I can't imagine that they would not benefit a patient with Lyme's disease. But it's a good question, and I'll look into that some more and see what I can dig up as far as, you know, what studies we have and what dosages they're being used and which are the mushrooms that were in those studies, if I can find them. Um, and this question here, if I may, I'll jump into it. You know, um, that's a good question. The, the, the biggest problem with reishi is its palatability, and you want to be able to get high enough dosages. We have it in capsules, so um, probably I would personally... If I were prescribing for you, which I'm not, um, recommend the purified reishi so that we can escalate the dosage to get a better antihistaminic effect. You know, when you have a, multi, a shotgun approach, you get a shotgun result. So um, you'd have to really escalate the dosage of the five defenders substantially in order to get the same kind of escalated dosage that you could with just using the reishi alone. But I don't, it's not based on, it's just based on my opinion. Um, my, th my thought process, not actually on any kind of objective study that I could you know, use to support this answer. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Where am I here? There. All right. Well, it is two o'clock, guys, mm -hmm. and we're going to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silver. Uh, sure. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we're already uh, excited about seeing you. 
Uh, so please go to the website, healthydogexpo.com, click on the downloads page and get the PDF notes that Dr. Silver has prepared for you. And who knows, we may even twist his arm and get him to come back here and do another one of these sessions. I'd love it. Just let me know. There you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be back on Tuesday with Jen Carter, I believe, from Volhard Dog Nutrition. Mm -hmm. And Thursday with someone else, a mystery guest. This is, so, so, this is so great that you're doing this, Lori. I have to well, say. Well, you know, I thought of so many people said, can we have online content? And it's just not financially possible for me to have a live event and a streamed event. Sure. And we have this free social media and we have all you guys. And it just takes an hour here and there. Mm -hmm. So it was a no brainer to do this. And I love how all of my sponsors were willing to step up, give me some of their time, give me their experts. It's just been great. Yeah. And we'll be here twice a week till the expo. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye for now.